is the consideration stage of the Housing Amendment Bill. And I call the Minister of Communities, Ms Carl Keelan, to move the bill. I beg to move. The members will have a copy of the Marshal the List de detailing the amendments in order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. There is a single group of amendments, amendments 1 to 3, which deal with rights uh, to buy schemes, and we will debate the amendments in turn. I would remind members to speak, intending to speak, that during the debate on the single group, they should address all the amendments on which they wish to comment. They will have that one opportunity. Once the group debate is completed, the other amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill. And the question on each will be put without further debate. The questions on stand part will be taken at appropriate points in the bill. And if that is clear, we shall proceed. No amendments have been tabled to clause one. <coughs> uh, the, uh, check, sorry. the question is that clause one stand, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to uh, clause two. The question is that clause two stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled for clause three. The question is that clause three stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause four. The question is that clause four stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause five. The question is that clause five stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. <coughs> no amendments have been tabled to clause six. The question is that clause six stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Now we come to the single group of amendments for debate. With amendment one, it will be convenient to debate amendments two and three. Members should note that amendment three is consequential to amendment one. Therefore, if amendment one is not made, I will not call Amendment 3. I call Mr Mark Durkin to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move Amendment 1. Before we commence the debate, however, I want to take this opportunity to, to offer my best wishes and those of the SDLP to Deirdre Hargey. We wish her a speedy recovery and hope that she is back behind the desk in the department before too long. We also send get well wishes to the principal deputy speaker. On the other hand, I want to welcome Minister Nikulain and congratulate her on her appointment. I'm sure she hopes it's a short one. Having worked with Carl as a minister in the executive, I know only too well the attributes that she will bring uh, to this extremely challenging role and look forward to working with her to deliver for people. The aim of this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, is to facilitate the reversal of the Office of National Statistics decision in 2016 to reclassify registered housing associations from the private sector to the public sector. Ultimately, the reason that we have to pass this bill, in Minister Hargey's words, is to protect the supply of new and existing social and affordable homes. Perhaps the most significant change will be an end to the compulsory need for registered housing associations to operate a house sales scheme. The amendments tabled today, in essence, seek to extend this change to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive 
our largest social housing landlord as well. Over the years, since the inception of this scheme in 1979, the Housing Executive has sold over 120,000 properties. It has 85,000 left. We all know people and families who have availed of this scheme. It has enabled people to enter the home ownership market, and many will speak of the pride, empowerment and security that has come from doing so. And nobody would or could take issue with the tens of thousands of families who have benefited from the scheme's existence. However, as legislators, we have to ask ourselves some serious questions. The housing waiting lists list currently stands at a staggering 38,000 households, with around 20,000 considered to be in housing stress and around 10,000 categorised as being homeless each and every year. Given the huge detrimental impact of housing stress and homelessness on families and individuals, ones living in temporary accommodation, crammed into overcrowded conditions with their extended families, sleeping on sofas, families having to separate from each other, can we as a society really afford to reduce our stock of social housing? When we are failing to build anywhere near enough homes to get beyond the tip of the housing crisis iceberg, should we really be selling off in the region of 500 homes a year? Is the right to own your own home not trumped by the basic human right to have a home? During the second stage debate a fortnight ago, much of the debate centred on Clause 7. Some members, Andy Allen from the Ulster Unionist Party and Johnny Buckley from the DUP, indicated their support for the retention of the right to buy, and that is the policy of their respective parties, and I, I respect that. However, that means it is incumbent on the rest of us, because all other parties who spoke on that day expressed either outright opposition to the right to buy policy or, in the case of Alliance, and Kelly Armstrong, they recognised the need to align the right to buy policies in housing associations and the housing executive. Would the member give way? I'll give way, certainly. Logic of the member's position. He says because we have so many people homeless, which truly is a shame, uh, that we cannot afford to sell any housing stock. But is the reality not that any stock that is sold is occupied by those who have been long-term tenants, who have no notion of giving up their tenancy, but are intent on staying in that house, and therefore whether they occupy it as an owner-occupier or as a long-term staying tenant isn't going to free up anything in the market for the homeless. Is that not the logical reality? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I appreciate and anticipated the, the point that uh, Mr. Alistair has made and will address it in the course of my speech. And, and if not, he can certainly come back to me on the wind. As it stands, Clause 7 creates an inequality in both access to social housing and home ownership. Tenants in housing executive properties will have the opportunity to one day purchase this property, their own home, but the same opportunity will not exist for housing association tenants. I'll give way. Okay. The, the member points out an inequality, um, but would he accept that the minister did say that she wanted to decouple these two issues and did intend to come back to the right to buy scheme within the housing executive at a later date, and also the fact that there is a two-year period within the right to buy scheme for housing associations? Your, your argument doesn't stack up. Uh, thank the member for his intervention. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the point that he is making. I, I, I do recall the minister expressing her desire to address this issue. But my point is, why not address it now, when we have this bill in, in front of us? This also, in the view of Housing Rights NI, will create potential difficulty in administering the social housing allocation system, which may allow some tenants a route to home ownership 
and not others. In turn, this could contribute again to some would-be tenants actually turning down reasonable offers of accommodation, which would compound the huge difficulties we already face in trying to address housing stress. These are points that members must consider. But what we really must consider, and I would like to know if Minister Hargey considered it before tabling this bill, is the Joint Consultation Response Report on proposals to seek reversal of the reclassification of registered housing associations in Northern Ireland. Consultation 1 on proposals to reverse the reclassification ran between December 2016 and February 2017, and it generated such responses in relation to the House Sales Scheme that it led the Department to consult further, hence Consultation 2, specifically on the issue of the House Sales Scheme, both for housing associations and the housing executive. This was carried out from 3 July 2018 to 24 September 2018. But remarkably, analysis of these consultation responses was only published by the Department for Community on Friday past, nearly two years after the second consultation was completed. At committee, we were told nothing about this report. Now, I'm not sure why there has been such a delay in the publication of the analysis of responses, particularly given the importance of this bill and the importance that the majority in this House attached to it getting accelerated passage through the Assembly. I opposed accelerated passage, and don't worry, I'm not going to rehash that whole argument. But how are we, as elected members of a Legislative Assembly, expected to make legislation and shape policy like this? I'm loath to land all this at your door, Minister Nikulain, but I'm fairly sure, having heard you speak many times of the importance of transparency, accountability and access to information, that you will share my concern and my confusion that this consultation analysis has only appeared now, somewhere between the 11th and 12th hours, as the legislation it relates to is halfway through the legislative process. In terms of policy making, that is absolutely appalling. And one has to wonder, had I and other members not asked about the findings of this consultation, would it ever have seen the light of day? I would recommend members to actually familiarise themselves with uh, the, the, the consultation and its responses. It can now be found on the Department for Communities website, but you won't find it in any information pack related to this debate. I should point out that, according to the consultation responses, there is overwhelming recognition of the need to end the mandatory house sales scheme in the housing executive and registered housing associations, just as my amendment seeks to do. Some members will ask why. Why should we end this scheme that has been so popular? I know it was the subject of a debate in this House in 2016 when Fra McCann brought a private member's motion calling for the immediate suspension of right to buy. And a quick read through the Hansard from that debate spells out quite clearly why. If we needed to do it in 2016, we most definitely need to do it now. In every year since, and including 2016, the housing executive has sold over 400 homes. This is where we are hemorrhaging housing stock. I spoke earlier about the number of households on the social housing waiting list. According to the Housing Statistics Bulletin, since 2002, that number has increased by a shocking 11,600 households. In the same period, the Housing Executive House Sales Scheme accounted for more than 10,000 social properties being taken out of stock. That is Housing Executive properties alone. Quite astonishing and well worth remembering the next time a desperate constituent contacts you for help with housing. More and more families are having to run the gauntlet of the private rental sector. How much would these families love to have a secure home? Now weigh that against the importance of owning a home. 
Defenders of the right to buy will highlight the opportunity it gives people to own their own home and lament the lack of other affordable housing options. And I won't disagree with them and will work with any minister uh, to ensure that we have more affordable housing options. But even with the discount, many will sadly struggle, and many do sadly struggle, to ever afford a mortgage, not to mention the costs that come with it. We will all be familiar with the sorry sight of boarded up former social housing units across our constituencies, bought, lost, repossessed, and now lying as empty eyesores in the possession of the banks, while the family that was in them is back to square one on a housing waiting list with a lot more snakes than ladders. Certainly. I thank the member for giving way and indeed for outlining my position from the beginning in support of that right to buy scheme and how I believe the importance of allowing people that fundamental right to, to get on the, the housing ladder and get off, uh, should they say, um, benefit from the, from the state in terms of housing. I think it's a, it's a good method. But would the member know and would he not agree with me? Clause 8 in the bill. Uh, outlines the, the potential for grants to be uh, supported by the Department uh, to allow non-statutory right-to-buy schemes. So therefore, potentially, what he is suggesting today is premature, because we haven't even seen, you've, you've quite rightly outlined the lack of scrutiny that the committee have been able to have on this piece of legislation, given the fact that we haven't had uh, representations from the housing sectors to the committee, that it is premature for us to bring forward the, the amendment in which he suggests because we have to first of all see what potentially grants can be available via Clause 8. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I thank the, the member for his intervention. I do not think I have an issue here with prematurity. Uh, I, I think had members listened to my appeal against giving this bill accelerated passage, we could have had much more time to scrutinise this. And I said at the time it was not my intention or desire to unpick the legislation. It is my desire to improve it, and I do believe, and I will reiterate, that we all need to work together to explore any options out there to ensure that we have more affordable homes as well as more social housing units for those who will never, sadly, be able to afford their own home. Home ownership is not without its pitfalls. Liability for repairs and insurances at the mercy of banks and interest rates, and now owners of former uh, social, social properties in a number of schemes in a, of two in my constituency at least, are getting hit with huge bills for uh, maintenance, general maintenance uh, schemes. Uh, one, one man who has been in with me is getting a bill of £4,000 because the, 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 the stairs and the outside of his apartment block is getting uh, painted. There are vultures out there, and we, we were warned of, of this in the previous debate by a number of speakers. There are vultures out there happy to swoop in and take people's former social homes off their hands. And sometimes the lure of a quick profit is a bit too much to resist for owner occupiers who sell their house on to these professional private landlords who just rent it out again and line their pockets with housing benefit, costing even more to the public purse. At second stage, Ms Anderson said the right to buy policy, and I quote, was never about home ownership on its own, but an attempt to turn aspects of social housing into something like the wild west of unbridled capitalism. She said that she was glad that the bill will put an end to two policies that threaten the provision of social housing. But it won't. It won't unless this amendment passes today. This policy has been completely scrapped in Scotland and Wales for local authorities and housing associations. The main reason for doing so was that it was losing much needed social housing stock, with the better stock being the stock that had been sold off. At present, with almost 40,000 households on our waiting lists, with the inevitable negative impact that social housing new build will have suffered as a consequence of COVID-19, we cannot continue to sell off stock and not replace it. 
I have already stated that many previous uh, right to buy properties have ended up in the private rented sector, charging much higher rents than the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. And housing benefit is underpinning a lot of this. This policy has also actually caused fragmentation of settled communities, as the private rental sector, by its nature, has much more transient tenants. I will wrap it up for now, Mr Deputy Speaker, but look forward to listening to the rest of the debate. I should also explain that Amendment 2 is virtually a technical extension of Amendment 1, and it would extend the two-year transition uh, period that Mr Allen has referred to to the housing executive, as is already proposed for housing associations. This means that all existing social housing tenants would have two years from the passage of this bill to commence the purchase of their homes, should they desire to do so. It creates equality. It also should serve as a reminder to those of you with reservations about supporting my amendments that right to buy is not going to vanish overnight. Amendment 3 is a consequential amendment that will change the long title of the bill after you have all voted in favour of amendments 1 and 2. Thank you. I implore you to support the amendments. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, before I make comment um, to Mr. Durkin's amendments, can I also put on the record and pass my best wishes for a speedy recovery um, to Deidre Hargay, the Minister, and um, also my party colleague, Christopher Stalford. And of course, welcome Carol McKellen back um, to the role of Minister. I'm sure she's delighted about it. And I'll say in committee, we will miss her, um, but we hope that she's back with us in committee. Um, sooner rather than later. Um, can I thank Mr Durkin? Um, I spoke to him outside before I came in here and said, Mark, will you please explain your rationale um, whenever you're opening up your debate? And he certainly did ex explain his rationale. And I have to say, you know, a great deal of it I agree with, with Mr Durkin on. I agree uh, about the inequality. And I think when I spoke in the, this chamber last on this issue, as the committee chair at that time, I had said about the, this could lead to an inequality um, between those that live in housing association and those that live in the housing executive. And I think the issue to do with right to buy uh, was well rehearsed in our last debate. And I, I just have to say, as a girl, um, who grew up in a housing estate in Mosley, whose parents had that opportunity um, to buy their own house back in the early 80s um, and, and then went on to move out of there. Um, I was very glad that that was available for us at that time. So I do have some regrets about right to buy, of course, uh, about losing the right to buy scheme. But I do hope, and I know the Minister had said it um, when she was here last, that another scheme would be brought forward to enable people um, to buy their own homes. Um, I, I suppose I, I just want some to say that I, I know that many people that move into our social housing sector um, don't move in with the attitude of, say, of thinking, here, I can go and buy my own house. They move into our social housing sector with the attitude, I need somewhere to live and this is where I'm going to live, and, or this is where I grew up, or this is where I want to live. It's not necessarily, oh great, I will move into one of these homes and in five years' time I will be able to buy it at a reduced price. I don't think that is the attitude of many people. I think for many people they move into their, their homes and they discover after a few years, OK, I have the ability to buy this. This is great. I can do this. So I don't think that, uh, that the fact that we're going to have two separate um, systems in place where we will see that there will be a massive increase in people wanting to move into housing executive properties, given the fact that they're generally older properties, and most of the, the housing association properties are newer properties, and people want newer properties. Um, so I, I, I absolutely get where Mr Durkin is coming from. I do think there is an inequality, but I do think the housing executive in general needs a complete and utter overhaul. I know we spoke about it during the talks last year. It was spoken about in, in uh, the agreement coming back here. It's been spoken about in our committee. I do think if it wasn't for COVID-19, we would be dealing with these issues now. We would have time to, to scrutinise and time to look at all of this, but sadly that hasn't happened. Um, and I know we're not here to look uh, again to debate um, the acceleration of this bill, but it does need to happen and it needs to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, we need for housing, uh, housing associations to be able to go out and borrow and to be able to build uh, and to be able to build those much needed homes. Um, so we, will, uh, we as a DUP will not be supporting, I'm 
sure that's no great shock to Mr Durkin anyway, will not be supporting his amendments, but I do absolutely understand where he's coming from. Um, I, 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 I do have a worry about the inequality going forward, so I would hope I would ask the Minister um, that, that this is something that is, is made more of a priority looking at the Housing Executive. We know we need to do it anyway. I know this Minister has um, very much deep issues and deep concerns around the Housing Executive and how we, we uh, go forward with that. And also on the part, part, point Mr Durkin made about the analysis of responses, that's extremely disappointing. It's certainly disappointing as a member of the, the, the Committee for Communities that we didn't get to see that information. And I'm, I, I'm sure Mr Durkin will bring that up in committee this week and hopefully then we will be able to write and ask why this wasn't brought forward to us as a committee and as members of, of this House um, uh, in, in considering this bill. So thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Sinead Innes. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, and I too want to send my best, best wishes to Deirdre Hargy and also to Christopher Stalford uh, for a speedy return. Um, as I said before, you know, I do want to place on record my thanks to the Minister for her fast and decisive action so far um, in providing the utmost support for our housing providers and those struggling to obtain a home, either through home ownership or social housing. If classified as public bodies, housing associations lose their ability to borrow from the financial transactions capital, as all borrowing would have to count as public sector borrowing. In real terms, this would reduce the number of social homes by approximately 50% each year and would dramatically reduce funding for the co-ownership scheme. I would ask members to consider what impact will this have in terms of supporting economic recovery in the aftermath of COVID-19. How many families um, are already struggling to obtain their, their own home in unfair conditions of overcrowding and young families still being penalised for the housing crash over a decade ago. This bill will ensure housing associations have the financial freedom to access much needed funding for social housing, new build and to continue the co-ownership scheme. Importantly, this will not come from the increasingly pressurised executive budget. If this re reclassification was implemented, housing association borrowing would be treated as public debt and deducted from the executive's capital budget. It's important to, to understand that this bill was previously, previously supported by all members of the Committee for Communities, including the use of accelerated passage, with no issues or concerns being raised. If I turn to the amendments, um, what we have here from Mr Durkin, I think, is, is a double and down um, of his bizarre misunderstanding of what this bill is actually about. Um, and I say bizarre because he sat at committee and he didn't raise any of these concerns. And despite what, what he says now, he did agree to the need for accelerated passage. So in bringing these amendments, it shows that he, he, he not only, uh, that are not only entirely unrelated to this bill, but he knows that they would fundamentally change the very nature of it to the point that ONS would reject it completely out of hand. So that tells me that despite his warm words, he is prepared to lose 50% of the social and affordable housing stock. And he is prepared to put the, the extra three million per month financial pressure on the department. And for what? to make a few ill-thought-out political points. I believe whole wholeheartedly that we need to completely revitalise the housing executive. We should have a housing executive that is properly, properly governed and fit for purpose, that deals with all the inequalities in housing. And Minister Hargey has agreed to, to tackling this. But damaging and jeopardising this bill is not the way to do that. The committee of which Mr Durkin is a member and the executive have all given consent for this bill to proceed through accelerated passage. And Mark mentioned in his opening comments, um, he, he, uh, he mentioned Housing Rights NI. ONS and Housing Rights NI are all telling us that this needs to get done. So I would suggest that he listens to them, and I suggest that we all listen to them. The proposed amendments risk a serious delay and therefore serious financial impl implications if they're not supported. Or sorry, if they are supported. So therefore, I would ask members to not support the proposed amendments and allow the necessary passage of this bill. Gurm I call Andy Allen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the member who proposes the amendments, you know, outlined his rationale and the, the hemorrhaging of housing stock from the, the social rented sector as his rationale for bringing these forward. And I don't think there's a member around this chamber who can seriously say that they haven't dealt with constituents who are in need of social housing who have been on the housing waiting list for years on end and haven't been frustrated as they've navigated the housing selection scheme to try to get those constituents uh, a roof over their head. There has been systemic failure. 
within government of not delivering enough social and affordable houses, and that is part of the key problem. Mr Alistair points out a fundamental point. I do not believe the majority of those individuals who go on to purchase those homes have any intention of moving on from those homes. So that will not address the issue in the medium to long term. Most of those residents who go on to purchase their home intend to stay there and their families intend to stay there. They are part of the community, they have been brought up in the community and they are part of the fabric of that community. They have no intention of moving on and indeed that has been articulated to me by a number of individuals who have went on to purchase their homes. Yep. Uh, can the member tell me then why, and where I live not too far, uh, if I go out for a walk, I can see for sale signs up in pensioner bungalows? If that's the case, what you're saying. So they do come on the market at some time, and that robs them from the chance of ever going out socially again. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. What I'm saying in the majority of cases, those individuals have no intent of moving on. I can't speak to those particular properties. I don't know them. I'm not familiar with them. But of course it happens. But in the majority of cases, that is not the intent behind the individuals of purchasing them, them homes. Of course, the, the right to buy scheme is not perfect. It does need amended. It could be a much uh, better scheme. But we, we do not support the members' amendments. We feel that they are unhelpful at this stage. With the minute, as I pointed out during my intervention, the Minister made very clear to the Committee when she presented to us on the 13th of May that the intent, the intent around this bill that she was bringing forward was to deal with the ONS reclassification. She has also made very, very clear that she intends to deal with the wider Houghton Executive and indeed the Houghton Executive right to buy at another stage. And we do have the transition period within the Houghton Associations. And I do, I do take on board and accept the members and my colleagues' uh, concerns around the inequality that this raises. But I do hope that we will see, and the ministers across the way, and I do hope that we will see. Uh, consideration or legislation being brought forward around the Houghton Executive right to buy, and my party, we will give it absolute fair win. We also, as the member for Upper Ban has pointed out, we need more detail. In our committee packs just last week, the department came back to say there was no additional detail around a, uh, the voluntary grant scheme. So we need to see more detail. We need to see more detail around what would replace the, the Houghton Executive right to buy scheme should we uh, abolish it also. So we will not be supporting amendments. And at the outset, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is perhaps remiss of me not to put on record mine and my party's best wishes for the, the Minister Deidre Hargey and indeed the Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, Mr Christopher Stalford, and welcome the, the, the Minister uh, to her place. And I am sure she will join with me in welcoming Deidre back when she is fit and ready. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And just as I start off, I would like to reiterate what my other colleagues have said and wish um, former Minister Deidre Hargey back to full health very soon and welcome her back in this chamber. To welcome Minister Carol McKillen to the post. Um, yes, we will miss her in committee because there's fond of knowledge there. Um, and also to, to um, make acknowledgement of um, Christopher Stolford, Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr Speaker, I, or Deputy Speaker, I, I recognise that we're whittling through speakers rightly at the moment, so um, I, I hope you good health for the next wee while. Um, <laughs> on this matter, um, unfortunately, I'm not able, on behalf of the Alliance Party, to support the amendments today. Um, like others have said, I am absolutely sympathetic. I do believe that the right to buy scheme had, has hemorrhaged houses out of our housing market, leaving the housing stress and the waiting lists in the situation that they are. However, if the member had stood up and said that his amendment was on the back of absolute clarification that he had received from ONS, that they would take forward the legislation with his amendment, that they would accept that, then I would have supported it. But I do not believe that the Office of National Statistics will accept that amendment and will take this through. And the result of that will be that social housing will lose money. It will not be able to borrow. It will not be able to build houses. And we will see an end to the co-ownership scheme because we will not be able to fund it either. This is a piece of legislation that needs to go through quickly because we are under pressure. This place was not here for three years. And as a result, we are left with a situation where a crisis is looming. If we do not sort out the issue of the classification or the reclassification of social housing, then there will be no new builds in social housing. And the impact that that has on our community is the construction industry, is the fact that people won't have houses that they can move into. It is a larger economic issue. 
The Housing Executive, the Minister has said that she will deal with that in the future, and I welcome that completely because the Housing Executive is sitting in a state at the moment where it is going to face an enormous bill for corporation tax in this financial year because it can't buy things to mitigate against that cost. And what impact will that have? That will have the impact that the Housing Executive may face huge difficulties in doing its own maintenance work. So we have to review the Housing Executive, and I will be fighting at that time for a review of the right to buy within the Housing Executive. And I believe that if we're going to have a voluntary scheme, that both Social Housing and the Housing Executive need to be similar, so that there isn't a differential. Now, the current legislation in front of us that's being proposed for amendment, the right to buy will continue on two years after it receives royal assent. When will that be? That could be a month from now, two months from now, it could be three months, it could be six months from now. So there's time then to look at the housing executive and to consider. I am very disappointed, however, that the department did not share with the committee all of the information prior to the minister being able to bring this to the House so the committee had time to discuss it. I appreciate we're going through um, a speedy resolution on this um, bill because of the nature of, of what's contained within it, but the committee does have to have its time and its place. And I hope that we will have that when we review the housing executive. So unfortunately, at this stage, I cannot support the amendments. I completely understand the rationale behind it. But if the member had said, ONS has said, yes, absolutely, bring the housing executive into this, and we will accept the, we accept the bill as it is, then that would have been no problem. But that's not here. And I just don't believe that, the, the, given the discussions that I have had with people within the department, um, referring to the ONS, that, that that's not a possibility at this stage. We do this now, and then we deal with the housing executive, and we can align the two going forward. We need to have a commitment to getting back to building houses and to take away those delays. Um, we need this necessary legislation for housing associations. And depending on how the review of the housing executive goes, it may well be brought into this legislation anyway. Thank you. I call Martina Anderson. I want to speak in favour of this bill, but before doing so, um, I want to send my best wishes to Deidre Hargy uh, and wish her a speedy recovery, and also to send best wishes to Christopher Stalford too. Um, I want to speak in favour um, of the bill because, as we know, across this island, uh, we are in the midst of a housing crisis. And you see, whether you live in the Bogside or Ballymun, or you live in the New Lords um, or new buildings, no child should be bought up believing that a hotel or a hostel, they shouldn't call it home. And I think that's something across this chamber that we all would agree with. When I think back uh, in 2002, that there were over 13,000 people on house and stress, and 17 years later, uh, we're 26,000 people. So we know the, uh, the challenge that is ahead of us. And this bill is about maintaining the support and supply of new homes necessary to help struggling families, along with the most vulnerable, uh, to access housing and have security and dignity. I firmly believe that the constituency that I come from would understand this bill and why we are taking the measures uh, and maybe giving support to it today. And despite the, the uh, member coming from the same constituency, um, I don't think that there would be widespread support for an amendment to be put in that could actually jeopardise this bill. And that's what we're talking about. Derry has one of the highest rates of people declared uh, as homeless in the entire north. And it has one of the lowest rates of new plans approved uh, to build additional social housing. In fact, even when we do have um, plans approved, for instance, because of austerity, Tory austerity and the slashing, for instance, of uh, bodies like NA Water, 
We can see that if I just refer to the Shandone scheme in Craigan, for instance, as one, you know, that scheme is, is stalled because among the many reasons for them social houses not being built, them houses not being built, is because we don't have the sewage capacity. And I know that's an issue in other areas as well. So this bill uh, is going to address the decision taken, as has been said, by the Office of National Statistics to classify the housing association as public or housing associations as public bodies. And that decision, if not addressed, and it has been stated here by other members, would put the ability to borrow in jeopardy, as well as impacting on the executive's um, capital spend programme. And I believe that's up to the tune of three million every month, something to that effect. So ensuring the, the private um, statute of the Housing Association allows them to borrow without scoring against public debt. And that is a good thing at any time, but it's particularly good as we're facing into all the challenges that the executive face with COVID-19. And therefore, it is only right that they continue their historical classification as private bodies. And this was something that was discussed among parties in the new decade, new, new approach. It finds expression in that this assembly must ensure that th there's maximum delivery of social, social and affordable housing for all of our citizens. And we have to do that as we face into what's going to be a tough time um, as we come out of, when we come out of, uh, this, this terrible pandemic. And one of the ways that we can do this around social and affordable houses, uh, housing is through the successful passage of this bill. And without this legislation, the reclassification of the registered housing association by the British government would deepen the housing crisis, as has been said, and could half the annual amount of council houses that could be built in the north. Again, we were dealing with all of this as we were leading into the new decade, new approach document. So if this reclassification is implemented, the executive would have to entirely fund the new building programme, potentially reducing the number of 1,850 new build starts down to 900, less than half. So we all know the rationale for why this bill is so important as it has been presented today uh, in terms of this consideration stage. And in the current, ho current housing crisis, with a, a never increasing waiting list, this is just unacceptable that the members and for the member to bring forward uh, the amendment that, that he may put in jeopardy all that has been already said. Now, I understand that there are approximately 60 housing association houses sold each year, and there are 300 housing association um, or housing executive homes sold. So this stock needs to be replenished. It needs to be replaced. We're all saying the same. And in one way, it might be understood why the member brought forward the amendment, but the Office of National Statistics is focusing on housing associations only. And as we heard Deirdre Hargy, Minister Deirdre Hargy, when she was in the chamber when we were last speaking about this, that she intends to bring forward proposals to deal with the housing, associate, the housing executive. And she's already committed to bringing those proposals forward um, on the housing executive. Proposals, I think, that will support tenants and protect the housing stock. Um, as uh, all uh, has already been said in here in terms of the right to buy scheme and how popular the right to buy scheme is. And, you know, there is a need for, for housing to be replenished for that stock to be replenished. And all of that needs to be discussed when the minister brings forward the bills around the, or the bill or the uh, proposal around the housing executive. The new decade, new approach does bring focus uh, to building houses in, in locations based on objective need. 
And I think that's crucially important too, as all of us know where the need, where the pressure is in relation to social houses. And that, for instance, is about focusing uh, in areas like the North West and in North Belfast and West Belfast. North West by North West, go ahead. I thank the member for giving way and indeed I accept the point and I think it's widely accepted across the House in relation to replenishing the housing stock. But would she acknowledge my, my bewilderment at the continuous criticism of the right to buy in this House, given number one how popular it was with social housing tenants? And secondly, across Northern Ireland, the right to buy scheme, I believe, has enhanced the social fabric of many of our communities throughout Northern Ireland. Would she accept those points? Well, I think without doubt the right to buy scheme has been very popular. And we only have to look at the number of people. My mother bought her own home. I'm actually living in that home. Uh, and she bought it under the right to buy. And there are thousands of people across Derry, across all of our uh, constituencies that have bought their own homes under the right to buy. The problem has been that those homes haven't been replenished. The problem has been that those homes hasn't been replaced. If you cut down a tree, you only plant 10 more. And what we need to be doing is making sure that the housing stock is capable of addressing the needs. And, and that's where we're at. And I think that's why it's important that objective need as identified in the new decade, new approach, deals with where there are the pressures. And we know the pressures in terms of social housing. Indeed, Minister, in your own constituency of North Belfast, uh, for instance, and as I said, North West by North West, and there are other areas as well before any of the other members. But I am the spokesperson for regional inequalities uh, for Sinn Féin, and I am going to be working with the Department of the Economies on advancing social housing in Derry based on what the new decade, new approach said, based on objective need. And Sinn Féin, like many more advocates, and I'm sure others in this House, believe that adequate housing is a human right. And we will, go, we will continue to, to promote that across the island. Uh, Minister, the legislation is a good step forward to ensure that the social housing stock is maintained. But it is clear, as I said, that we need to address housing shortage, shortage particularly in those areas like Derry, like North Belfast, who have suffered from persistent and chronic housing inequality. And as New Decade New Approach says, and I can't say this enough, we have to allocate resources based on objective need, wherever that objective need uh, takes us. I will fight for people in the Shankill as much as I will fight for people in the Falls. I will fight for people across the North wherever the need requires that we have to address that need. But I think in many ways it's shameful that previous ministers who had a policy of targeting social housing based on need, that they abolished that policy. And that was done by not one but by two SDLP ministers, which adversely affected on the very constituency that the members bringing forward this amendment today Can I draw in the Derry member back and Belfast. The bill, so yes, yes, I, I will. So I just want to um, say that Minister Hargey has done a very good job. She's worked very hard in allocating resources uh, where they are needed. And I think that um, an approach very much in line, I believe, with, uh, with Minister McKillen's approach in relation to tackling need and tackling social houses. And I know um, and ta tackling need and addressing the need for more social houses. And I'm sure that uh, Minister Hargey will be very pleased, as I am and many others, to see that her department and this bill is being taken forward by Minister Nikhilin at this moment in time because she is coming from the same mindset and the same approach as Minister Hargy. And I wish you well in the time that you spend um, in, in looking after the department. And I'm sure, like us all, you'll be glad to see Deirdre return, but I know she will be delighted that her department is in safe hands. Thank you. I call Rachel Woods. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And like other members here, I wish to wish Deirdre Hargrave a speedy recovery, Mr. Stelford too, and welcome Carl to the Chamber today. Last time I rose in support of the principle of this bill, appreciating the need for the reclassification of housing associations as private bodies and what this means for the future of social housing in Northern Ireland. And whilst recognising the importance of this, I, like many others, raised some concerns, especially on the right to buy scheme, which are again being discussed here at consideration stage through these amendments. There is still an issue with the potential to create more inequality in access to both social housing and home ownership. Many tenants in social homes aspire to home ownership, and the right to buy scheme is often their only hope of fulfilling this aspiration. But will this contribute to some tenants consciously turning down a reasonable offer of accommodation where there is no possibility of future home ownership? Still waiting on a bit more detail on that. But we welcome the amendments being put forward today to include the Northern Ireland Housing Executive within the ending of the right to buy scheme. The Housing Executive Housing Sales Scheme accounted for more than 10,000 social properties being taken out of stock since 2002, and in their 2018-2019 annual report, they stated that they'd sold 449 properties through the scheme, which is up from 436 the previous year. So we are losing much more social housing through the sales scheme than that of the housing associations. So I would like to seek some clarification on the exact figures around the number of properties which have been sold by the housing executive and the housing associations in total since the housing scheme started, and how many homes have been built in that time. We have consulted on this. Two years ago, the consultation was launched by the Department for Communities when we had no assembly sitting, and the joint consultation response report on proposals to seek reversal of the reclassification of registered housing associations was published a few days ago. And the agreement from the respondents on repealing the amendments to the right rebuy, and some 18 were in favour of ending the housing sales schemes for all social tenants. So I'd like to ask the Minister here today, is this something that actually can be done through this bill? Given the two years lead in time for a change in the policy within the housing executive, and has there been any advice issued on this? And what we do need to do is remove the right to buy scheme and build more housing in order to provide housing security and stability. Therefore, if the opportunity exists here through this to amend the right to buy scheme within the housing association and put an end to it over the next two years, I think we should use this opportunity to do so. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to wish uh, Minister Hargey well and, and uh, uh, Deputy Speaker Stop, Mr. Stafford well uh, as well. Um, uh, I want to speak in support of the amendment. Um, it seems to be there's a, there's a pattern in the House that uh, members who bring amendments are castigated for daring to bring them. Um, but I want to thank uh, Mr. Durkin for bringing the amendment, um, and I want to support it. And I think there's a concern that there has been a concerted strategy um, to whittle down the housing executive. Um, we have obviously heard of uh, attempts to transfer stock. Um, thankfully, they have been defeated through public ballots. But there has been a general approach to say public uh, is bad, private knows better, uh, and private will, will deliver in a better sense. I will address some of that um, as, I, as I continue through my comments. So I think the amendment is important, uh, and I want to support it and speak in favour of it. But I think it is concerning, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the extent uh, of bills and legislation coming through the House without time for proper scrutiny. And members on the committee have said that, uh, and there are still serious questions left uh, unanswered. Uh, we have a situation only a few weeks ago. We were asked to endorse a budget bill uh, with a lot of detail um, not, uh, not there with a lot of scrutiny uh, not uh, taking place, um, and never mind detail about efficiency savings uh, and cuts uh, mentioned uh, in that. And even today, we have been asked to endorse an LCM uh, with the Department of Health unable to ask fundamental questions, despite myself and others on the Health Committee raising questions uh, twice about a serious piece of legislation. And I think here we have a situation and a scenario in front of us today, in the middle of a health pandemic, we are rushing through legislation that will have big ramifications uh, for housing and public services more generally across our society. There is nothing wrong with doing things quickly, provided they are done correctly, uh, and information gathered, evidence is heard. And we have heard from multiple people today and previously that this has not been done. The full extent of it has not uh, been uh, completed. And many people will be asking why the urgency. Um, especially as there is no evidence that the passing of this bill, the uh, reprivatisation of housing associations, there is no evidence that this will lead to tackling 
uh, our housing crisis or lead to the, the figures that uh, the housing associations have indicated they may uh, build. So that's important to emphasise. Um, and I think there, there, there are concerns fundamentally about the nature uh, of the bill. Um, the department obviously consulted, uh, I think Ms. Ms. Wood said, in 2018 around the proposed changes. There were only 30 responses. I mean, this is a big piece of legislation, a big bill, uh, big uh, changes, and only 30 people responding. Does not, to me, indicate a wide, deep consultation process where large numbers of people uh, were engaged uh, in it. And I think there's been an element of a shock doctrine approach uh, throughout this crisis, rushing through changes uh, and legislation now, and the hope of scrutiny will come at some magical date down uh, in the future, and that point likely will not or ever materialise. Um, and I think obviously people are, are correctly focused on the, the coronavirus crisis and tackling it. And I think there's a, there's a thought process, perhaps, to say that this is a, a good time to push through. Uh, bad legislation, and I believe that at the heart of uh, the main tenets of this bill uh, is bad legislation. Um, it's worth remembering that you know, the reclassification was initially proposed by the Tories and, and Sajid Javid. I mean, at the very least, we should be suspicious uh, of this um, in terms of the merits uh, and the reasons for the proposal. And I'm concerned that we are following another reckless Tory path by endorsing this bill. Uh, again, uh, and the right to buy scheme was designed, as I'm sure people know, whether they're for it or against it, was designed by Thatcher, and it's disappointing that people have, have bought into it. And from my experience, in terms of people I've been speaking to around uh, right to buy or successions, uh, they want to see the, the house kept in the family home. So I think we need to have a conversation that says, recognises that we need to defend the housing executive as a public institution. But how can we extend and enhance the right to successions uh, so homes can be kept in families for maybe a bit longer than, than they currently are, especially in relation to housing associations? Uh, and I think, like I said previously, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, this bill, uh, we oppose the main tenants of it because it does seek to privatise and deregulate housing associations, uh, whilst at the same time maintaining, if not possibly increasing, the public money uh, that they receive. Uh, as I said before, clauses 1, 3, 4, 5 and 6 all restrict the powers of the department um, in terms of disposal of land, uh, the merging of housing associations uh, and with the housing associations just merely having to notify uh, the department of their actions. So a very con uh, serious concern about a lack uh, of scrutiny uh, at the heart of this bill. Um, and obviously, Clause 7, as has been, uh, has been said, uh, abolishes the, the right to buy scheme for, for housing associations, uh, but the, the amendment would uh, extend that to the housing executive, which, as I said, I uh, would support. Uh, and I think the whole fundamental ideology of uh, public being bad, private being good, like I said, is at the heart uh, of this, and it needs to be challenged. Uh, we need to not buy into this free market claptrap that they know better, that they know best. You know, we saw uh, people quite rightly clapping for the NHS throughout this uh, coronavirus crisis. And I think there's a uh, renewed desire to see public services delivered by public bodies and institutions, not um, housing associations being further uh, being privatised. Uh, and I think the, um, the, the housing rights organisation uh, said in relation to the first change, I think it was 2016, uh, around housing associations gaining public status. They said that that will mean that they could potentially, and I quote, potentially be subject to a broader range of human rights law in exercising their duties. Surely that's a good thing. Surely that's a good thing. And obviously, with the reclassification uh, of these uh, housing associations, it will have the opposite effect, um, may, uh, potentially raising big, big human rights concerns. So, at the very least, that should be a warning. Uh, saying for people. And we know the long history of privatisation that it ha has had for rents being increased, um, service delivery worsening, uh, and the increased possibility uh, of eviction. Uh, I don't normally quote the PwC, Mr Deputy Speaker, but in 2011 they said that the housing executive is one of the success stories of the past 40 years, and it is rightly regarded nationally and internationally as a leading authority on best practice on housing management and community building. And I think we need to strengthen that 
um, generally, but especially today with this amendment. And I'm concerned that we're hearing there may be measures brought in the future. Um, if they're good, obviously we'll look at them, support them uh, if they're um, what's needed. But you know, how long have parties needed to strengthen, to enhance, to protect the housing executive? There's been a failure, uh, executive after executive. And I think uh, throughout this debate today and, and the, the first stage uh, of the debate uh, on the bill, nothing has been said about the additional positive benefits of public scrutiny in respect of stock conditions, maintenance repairs, rent controls, uh, maintenance fees, and these issues. Um, and I think that's very, very concerning uh, uh, indeed. Uh, so, just to conclude, I think public accountability, Mr. Deputy Speaker, public accountability is a good thing. We should seek to enhance it, to protect it, and this bill does the opposite, the complete opposite of it. Uh, and I would just like to say, I think uh, it shouldn't be up to the ONS to determine our housing policy. I think this House should determine its own housing policy uh, and what's best for uh, the public at large and our constituents. And like I said, in closing, there's no evidence uh, that this bill if passed, we will tackle the housing crisis. There is no evidence that the Housing Association uh, new start targets uh, will be met and have been failed year on year on year. And I think the best way to deliver housing, um, social housing is through enhancing, protecting and allowing the housing executive to uh, borrow and build. So I will include my remarks uh, there. Thank you. I now call on the Minister for Communities, Ms Karen Killen, to respond to the debate. Gordon Milgut, um, last Khan Kolya, and indeed I want to join um, the, the, the remarks that people have started off with. I'm wishing Dirdre Hargill the best. I don't know what the crack is with Christopher, but I wish him the best as well. And thank people for their generous comments um, for me stepping in, hopefully for a very short time. So, um, look, I mean, I'll, I'll start with with, uh, with Jerry's point. Which was last. I'm going to start with it first, because, and I just want to make this clear: there, there is, there's absolutely no issue with anybody bringing forward any amendment for any bit of legislation. That's what this place is for. You may agree with it, you may disagree with it. People may be hot and heavy in their agreement or disagreement, but that is fundamentally their right. This is a legislative assembly to bring forward legislation, either uh, amended or not amended. So. You know, from that end, I don't, you know, I, I don't recognise what he's saying, and it certainly won't be the case here. I mean, Mark did raise concerns uh, about accelerated passage, but in fairness to him, I don't think he voted against it, right? In order to make, sure, yeah. So, um, but, but I do think, you know, it's his prerogative, as it is every one, one of us, to bring forward amendments if we so, if we feel they're fit. Where I disagree with the amendment in this case is that I completely accept the points that he's making in his amendment that there does need to be a read across in terms of going through to the housing executive because you don't want to cause a gap or inequality either. However, if this bill, that, that, that amendment does not meet the criteria for this to go through, and that's, that's from a part company, and that's basically it. Um, you know, I want to say on the record, um, I too got the report on Friday and thought on the first look at it that it was part of assembly materials in preparation for this debate and then discovered that it was something completely different. So I'm going to, I know the department's listening or the officials are listening, I'm going to bring that back because I don't think that's acceptable. To be quite honest, I don't think it's acceptable. I know if Dirty Hargy was standing here, she would say the same thing. So it's not acceptable. Um, and I will get you an explanation of what happened. Even if I don't like it, you don't like it, you will get it. So um, we'll be consistent in that. Um, this was in the new decade, new approach. And you know, the reason it was there is because accelerated passage was needed. I mean, the constant or the, the derogation on this, um, or the, the deadline on it rather than derogation, runs out on the 31st of March 2021. So that's why we're here, in order to you know, get the legislative competence in, but also to stop three million pounds a month from the public purse being used. And three million pounds a month is equivalent to 45 social houses. So I don't know anybody in this house who would be happy with that record. That, you know, we're all coming from a background 
or some more than others, um, you know, appreciate the fact that you know many of us uh, are first home, and some of us our own home. Currently, our own homes are from a public housing authority and not of the housing executive. Um, we did have debates here, and you will remember, Mark um, and others, that Fran McCann, I'm going to say Fran McCann and passion in the same breath, but Fran, Fran McCann's passionate plea around ain't the right to buy is still our position. And it's our position because that stock, and fundamentally, this is something that I think we all agree on, but not many people spoke about it. See, once those houses are sold under the right to buy scheme, be it House Association or Housing Executive, they're never replaced. And that's the problem. So, Andy, you were right. Most people who do um, buy their home under the right to buy normally stay there. But I also know of others, um, and I can't mind, well, I think it was Mark, about some of the antiques of some of the developers that would be akin to vultures. They're almost waiting on older people. Encourage them to buy their house. Give them a couple of pounds. They think they're passing on to their children and grandchildren and then all of a sudden they're homeless, and sometimes they're allowed to stay, and then you're paying housing benefit, which is twice, twice the cost to the public purse, and then some. I think we all agree, and we've all said this, that the housing executive does need to be addressed in terms of what we do next. And Paula Bradley, the chair, also pointed out that there are concerns around the potential inequalities, but we all remember, and I'll, I'll just remind people again, Deirdre Hargy said at the committee, she also said it as part of this debate, that her next route would be to bring legislation forward to close that gap for the housing executive and take the same phased approach around this scheme so it isn't the sudden shock to people who may want to buy their homes. You do need to give people a lead-in period. That is under good compliance. It's also good uh, practice and it's good guidance. My other concern in relation to your amendments, Mark, would be that I think it may, and, uh, and you know I'm only here, so you know you can roll your eyes if you want. But even just instinctively, I looked at the, I looked at the amendments, I looked at the bill, and thought there's potential for legal challenge. If, if seven, if your amendment was carried, then it goes outside of the competence of the ONS criteria. So, and then that would hold things back. So when people talk about holding back, for me, that's that's what it looked like, and holding things back. I don't think anybody wants. So while Mark's concerns are right and they're right to be raised, I just think this is the wrong vehicle and the wrong avenue, and it is something that we need to, to bring back. Um, and Kelly Armstrong also pointed out this concern in terms of any potential knock-on, um, as did every other member. The housing executive and their, their um, ability or their, sh their exemption should be from not paying corporation tax which too was part of the negotiations that we all you know, had concerns about and raised that. So from memory, I think it was something like 13 million a year around about that, stand to be corrected. Um, and it is quite a lot of money. You know? So you, there are things that we know when we talk about the revitalisation or the improvement of housing excited, we're going to have to have a look at. And reducing the expenditure to the public purse is one thing that we need to look at, and this is why this bill is so important. Three million a year, 45 houses a month. Look at the, the number of houses that you could have at the end, and, and, and that is the realm that you're talking in. And uh, Rachel Woods also raised uh, a question that I too want to know. So just to repeat you, I also will try and find out exactly how many homes have been sold under Housing Executive and Housing Association and exactly how many homes under Housing Executive and Housing Association have been built. And I'll go further than that. I'll also try and find out in which areas they've been built in. Because from memory, not always, but they're not built in areas where there's highest demand, and that's the problem. And Andy Allen talked about systemic inequality, as did Martine Anderson. She did us. Everybody did. We're all coming at this from a view that we want to look after constituents who, let's be honest, while they're in housing stress, are miserable. In my own constituency, my neighbours on the New Lodge Road have three generations living under the one roof. It's having a problem on people's mental health. Teenagers are growing up with no privacy. It's just horrible. None of us want that in our watch. But what's your lie? 
Minister, uh, and you've undertaken to clarify a number of points of information. Perhaps another area to clarify is um, the systemic failure of right to buy and, and maybe how the right to buy has been implemented. And I have highlighted it hasn't been perfect. Is how much revenue has been generated through the house sales scheme, and then. Secondly, to that, how much of that revenue has been reinvested back into new social housing bills? Well, surely. Um, and not only was it the, the concern around how it was reinvested, but uh, you may remember at some stage there was discussion around investing into the maintenance programme of housing and executive homes, because a lot of them are quite old. And even if you look at the Savills report, which we're going to be dealing with at the committee, the bill there is absolutely huge. And I will say this for rural colleagues, um, even though you might think of a brass neck living on the new Lodge Road, but I, I know there's more, real, there's more field poverty in rural communities at times because the houses are older, they're harder to heat, the efficiency isn't there as what it would be for a new house for housing associations. And those families are going to be living in poverty. None of us want that either. So, um, so Mark, I'm coming to no surprise and not be accepting the amendments. Um, but I absolutely defend your right and anybody else's right to bring them forward. And uh, what I want to finish on, and I've absolutely no doubt we'll come back to this at other stages. Um, but, 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 but let me be clear um, to Jerry. He raised the point um, at, the, at the last. Um, I don't think anybody could describe any, anyone as supporting uh, a Thatcherite policy in terms of the right to buy and leaving people. So I want to be clear. I know it's probably a political dig, um, and again, he's a right to do that, but I, I think it's a bit churlish. I also think what is churlish is the lack of um, knowledge and experience about the fact that housing associations and housing executive tenants have the same rights when it comes to allocation, it has to be done on the basis of objective need. That's not going to go away. That's in law. It has to happen. And I think he's right to raise it. Those tenants, be they in housing association or housing executive, also need to have the same protections as well. And that is steadfast. I think you know, that is something that I just want to get completely clear. And if there's any evidence, if this passes, that that is not the case, then I too will join with him and others in ensuring who's ever stand in this position will be made aware of it and what's more will do something about it. For us, for us as an assembly, you know, would we have liked to have dealt with this differently? Absolutely. I think we all can agree on that. Uh, would we like to have an opportunity to scrutinise more? Absolutely. And I think that was even accentuated when we all got the report last week. I think people were rightly annoyed. So we just need to deal with that. So I want to thank everybody for their contributions. Um, again, I'm sure Christopher and Dirdre will be listening to the best wishes, but, um, but, but they're also genuine, and I wish both of them well. And I would ask you not to support the amendments uh, that Marcus brought forward, Gorm Malkov. <coughs> Can I remind members when they're addressing uh, the House that they should address the chair? It tends to help a Hansard with the microphone's positioning to pick up old comments. Um, and I call Mr Mark Durkin to conclude and wind up the debate on the amendments. To ask the Minister to repeat that. I'd like to uh, thank members for their contributions today and I will attempt to address uh, some, if not all, of the issues raised. Uh, the first contribution was from uh, Paula Bradley, Chair of the Department for Communities Committee. And I agree entirely with her about the need to, well, I think she used the word overhaul, I might use the word reinvigorate the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. She made the point that generally housing association properties are a wee bit swankier than the older housing executive stock and therefore more attractive. But what she didn't mention is the fact that that's reflected in the rents for these properties, sometimes nearly twice uh, the, the, the cost, and that doesn't make them that attractive after all. Uh, Ms Ennis uh, made a contribution then. She commenced by extolling the virtues of the bill, and let me reiterate, I support the bill. Uh, I did raise concerns in the committee. I, I, again, she, she says I, I didn't. I know it was over the phone. Maybe the member missed it. I explained it again in the last debate. I actually apologised for the fact in the last debate. 
maybe she missed it again. These amendments, in my view, and it's just my view, I haven't sought legal opinion, I don't know if anyone else has, would not risk the passage of the bill. They do not. I am not sure how they would. So for the member to accuse me of making ill-thought-out political points, she might want to read over her own contributions and reflect on them. Andy Allen came in and made an impassioned defence of the right to buy scheme. He referred to the Minister's pledge to bring forward legislation to deal with the housing executive and the right to buy. But I have to ask, when? The clock is ticking on this uh, mandate. And I might ask the member, will he support any such uh, proposals that do come forward if the Minister does bring something forward uh, to address the right to buy scheme? Certainly. And the member may note in my uh, remarks towards the end, I did say that I and my party will give any proposals from the Minister Furwin in that respect. Okay. Uh, Andy also uh, made the point for the assertion that most families who purchase uh, a social home remain in it, and that is borne out uh, by a piece of research recently completed uh, by the Housing Executive. It demonstrates, and, and, and it is a broad uh, bit of analysis they did, but of the 120,500 Housing Executive properties sold since 1979, it is their conclusion that almost half were still owned, uh, or by, or owned and occupied by the original purchaser. Just over a quarter were uh, owned by someone other than the original purchaser, and just over a quarter were rented privately, the majority by uh, private landlords, but a small proportion by housing associations who have started to buy some back. Kelly Armstrong seemed to be of the view, and, and I, I can accept entirely her position, that ONS will not accept the amendment, but I have yet to hear a compelling reason why they would not. And like I say, I think it's imperative that, that we do pursue that. They, uh, she said the alliance were, con or, sorry, ONS were concerned about the reclassification or classification of housing associations, and the bill addresses that as it stands, and the bill will still address that uh, if amended. She asked if the department or said if the minister stood up and said that they had it from ONS that it wouldn't jeopardise it, that she'd have no baller supporting this amendment. But I'll just remind her that this is the same department that has sat on the consultation <laughs> into this for two years before it saw the light of day. Uh, M Martina Anderson then spoke for Sinn Féin. She said, spoke about the housing crisis across the island, and that is true, and that is lamentable. And her party have been extremely vociferous about this issue in the South. And I just wonder what Owen O'Brien would think of Sinn Féin's opposition to my amendments today. She spoke of widespread support for the bill. I conducted a wee consultation of my own at the weekend, not too scientific, just through the power of Facebook, and I got over 50 responses from people in my, or sorry, our shared constituency. And it was a fairly mixed bag. People saw merits and drawbacks of the policy, but all of them lamented the lack of social housing. When I read through the answer of the 2016 debate, when her party called for the immediate suspension of this scheme, a number of Sinn Féin anti-UP members waxed lyrical about the 10,000 new social homes that were going to be built in that mandate. As we know, that mandate did not last well long. But where have the homes gone? How many of that 10,000 have been delivered? Half. And in the same time, we have lost maybe 1,800 homes through the right to buy schemes. It has been over 400 homes for each of the past five years, not 300, as the member said. I think it is important that, that, that we do work with all parties, and the member pledged to do so, work with all parties to deliver more social housing, and we look for all parties to do what is required to ensure that we deliver more social housing. We will need executive support for resources for Northern Ireland Water to ensure appropriate water and waste infrastructure to enable new builds. When DFC is not building enough houses, it is down to Tory austerity. But when Northern Ireland Water can't afford to put in infrastructure, it is all Nicola Mallon's fault. I think that is something that we really need to look at as an executive and stop this uh, petty point scoring. 
The member proceeded to make points about party poly colleagues of mine that there were no relevance to the amendments and little semblance to reality. It would seem for Ms Anderson, attack is still the best form of defence. Appreciated support and sympathy from uh, the Greens and people before profit. And I want to go back to the point, and I think it was uh, Rachel who asked it, have we anything definitive from ONS? Have the Department even sought an opinion from them on the validity of these amendments or the competence of them? The point made by Mr Allister and echoed by Andy Allen I would like to address as well, and that was that homes sold do not equate to homes lost because they still house people, but they are lost to social housing stock. And if we had lots of surplus stock, that would be grand, but we don't. Is it not government's primary obligation to provide homes for those most in need? People who are homeless have greater need than those in secure accommodation. If we did not have a huge backlog of unaddressed housing need, then this would not be an issue. But we do, and it is. Minister Nikulain slipped back into the role with ease. It is like riding a bike, I think, Carl. But Again, I want to ask you, do you have it in writing that the ONS would not accept these amendments? And if you do, can, can we see it? Failure to pass this bill, we were reminded, will cost £3 million per month that would be spent on new bills. Can we expect then that when it does pass, and I will be supporting its passage, that every penny of that uh, money will be ring-fenced for this purpose? I made the point last time, though, and I will make it again, that the cost of us not having a government for three years was therefore over £40 million and 700 new social homes for struggling families. So I won't take lectures from Sinn Féin on me jeopardising budgets. And to be fair, that criticism did not come from the Minister, who was measured in her approach and explanation, but from her party colleagues. I am disappointed. It is obvious that that my amendments will not pass. I genuinely thought that this was a great opportunity to ensure full protection of our social housing stock. I would like to reiterate my commitment to work with the Minister to deliver more social housing for the thousands of families and individuals out there in severe housing stress. Thank you. Amendment proposed to Clause 7, page 6, line 34. Leave out and insert words as printed, printed on the marshalled list. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. 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 All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. I think the no's have it. I think the no's have it. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. And I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Order members. Would members resume their seat? Before I put the question, I would again remind members, uh, if it is possible, it would be much preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. I think the no's have it. Aye. I think the no's have it. Aye. Do we have tellers? Order members, the following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Jerry Carl and Pat Capney. Tellers for the nose, Sinead Ennis and Orla Finn. Flynn. Before the Assembly divides, remind members that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. 
It is important that during any division that social distancing in the chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any member in the chamber who are not due to vote in person should leave the chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the chamber to which they are sitting should leave the chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. However, if a member who needs to vote in both lobbies, they should not leave the chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times and to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobby. The House the Assembly will divide eyes to my right, nose to my left. Do you ring the bells again? <coughs> Order members, would the clerk please read the result? 87, oh, 84 members voted, 14 members voted aye, 70 members voted no. The motion is negatived. The motion is negative. The motion is negative. Unfasten the doors. <clears throat> I'll just pause for a moment in case any member wishes to return to the chamber. Amendment number two has already been debated, and I call Mr. Mark Durkin to move formally Amendment two. Not moved. Amendment two not moved. The question is that clause seven stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. I put the question again. The question is that clause 7 of the bill stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause 8. The question is that clause 8 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause nine. The question is that clause nine stand part of the stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause ten. The question is that clause ten stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause 11. The question is that clause 11 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to the schedule. The question is that the schedule stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will not call amendment, uh, amendment three as it is consequential to Amendment one, which has not been made. Let me see where we go. Is that the long title? The question is the long title. Stand part of the bill. Uh, be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And that concludes the consideration stage of the Housing Amendment Bill. The bill stands referred to the Speaker. 
Can I remind members that the deadline for tabling amendments for the further consideration stage is tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. And now I would ask you to take your ease for a few moments. Order members, the next two motions.